So as you're all well aware, advocacy burnout is a big deal because we, I know, always feel like we're continually educating people about music therapy. So what can we do as music therapists to decide where we need to focus our advocacy energy so we don't run out? That's an excellent question. One of the things that we can begin to do is to, to figure out from a perspective of what kind of a personality we have. Mm -hmm. Thinking about do we like to be right front and center, directing the conversation? Do we like to talk right to the decision makers? Or are we the person who prefers to do some writing, uh, writing of blogs, writing of letters, perhaps even sitting at the advocacy, um, an advocacy event where you're stuffing envelopes? We need all kinds of advocates, and it doesn't matter you know, what kind of advocacy, they're all important. And so embracing who you are as a person and then knowing that you are contributing to the wider advocacy network and, and efforts that the association does through your own personality and who you are as a person. So to build on that, if you are a more um, less speaking directly to the decision maker type and more of an introverted type, a good writer, um, write articles, write blog posts about both music therapy and music therapy related products and then those other products that aren't music therapy like the apps that I think we're all familiar with. You know there are some apps where maybe you just need relaxation there's nothing wrong with that app but if we can provide information about those first and kind of maybe do reviews of all of them and let people know which ones we think are recommended and what they could be used for then we can manage that information that's getting out to the public. I think it's also important to think about um, as a student, um, kind of, you are the first interaction or first introduction that a lot of your people, your network, will have to music therapy. Um, and so writing those blog posts or sharing those reviews or writing those reviews um, is something that you can really easily do to kind of give that first taste of what music therapy is and kind of start um, the education of your family and of your friends uh, kind of on the right foot. I think taking what both of you just said and just uh, keeping that in mind that we can control the conversation more. We can be more proactive mm -hmm. rather than reactive. I think we see a website or an app or a blog post and we feel a little bit helpless like what is this information that this person is putting out there? But we have to remember that there are thousands of us and we can actually chime in too mm -hmm. and we can put yes. out better information that's more accurate and, yes. and, and helpful mm -hmm. because we talked about wanting to be helpful and one of the ways we can do that is to review products, talk about maybe their benefits, but then steer the consumer towards the most appropriate product right. mm -hmm. through the lens of a music therapist. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Talking about what do you, what's your real goal. If your goal is to you know, fall asleep quicker at night, all right, that's not music therapy really. Use the app that has the nature sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, but if your goal is to change behavior or help somebody in a therapeutic goal, then we can say, now you need a music therapist. So validating both things, but just putting out the information so it'll help the consumer and help the clients mm -hmm. that need help. And to, to uh, play off of that, helping the consumers understand that there's a place for everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes maybe they are not looking for therapy. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're looking for ways to connect with their community. Maybe they're looking for, uh, you know, something to, as just as we take an aspirin or an ibuprofen, we're using music to help soothe ourselves and, 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 and use a self-soothing strategy, not necessarily have therapy or maybe there's that connection of the two and maybe they didn't know music therapy existed and so to be able to provide some distinction mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. those and distinguish what is what the different elements are so that they can understand and make informed decisions as, as healthcare or uh, educational consumers or students. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that helps me uh, to advocate um, because we talked about mm -hmm. what is at the root of advocacy and uh, we talked about connecting with influencers mm -hmm. and decision makers. So when, when we're thinking about well where should I put my advocacy energy really um, in addition to the role that I want to play. 
I also can filter out some of the, you know, the outliers and the minutia that's out there. And, and by, by asking the question, is this blog post or is this person's little program or their website, are they influencing music therapy? Are they making decisions about music therapy? And usually the answer is probably no. So we can then focus more on government, you know, regulations, big organizations, the big issues, the big picture stuff. And, and if we do that, and if we make progress in that area, like through licensure or you know, recognition, et cetera, then the little stuff will be taken care of automatically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Prioritize. Yeah. Yeah. Prioritize, mm -hmm. yeah. So we don't get burned out ourselves. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, because advocacy is exhausting. <laughs> and we, <laughs> we have to think about where are we going to focus those energies so we can take good care of ourselves, so we can take care of our patients. Mm -hmm. So find out what you're good at, what kind of advocate you are, but then also let's put our advocacy energy in the right, in the right places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.